Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the Messerschmitt ME 410 A1U2, a German heavy fighter coming at a tier 3 and a battery rating of 4.3. Having already provided a general overview to the Messerschmitt 410 and on top of that the A1 sub variant as may be seen in my original ME 410 A1 review, link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. Today's historical overview is going to focus particularly on the Umrus Balzetta or factory conversion set applied to the ME 410A1 sub variant and the eventual creation of the ME 410A1U2 which you're seeing on screen today. With that we begin thus. Following the acceptance of the ME 410A1 Schnell Bomber, I Fast Bomber and ME 410A2 Zestora, I Destroyer into Luftwaffe service in January of 1943, Messerschmitt decided to develop two Umrus Balzetta to convert the A1 subvariant into a heavy fighter that could conduct either the reconnaissance or Zestora roles. The reconnaissance conversion of the A1 was designated as the ME 410 A1U1, whereby it saw the fitting of a single RB2030, RB5030, or RB7530 camera into the central fuselage. Meanwhile, the Zestora conversion was designated as the ME 410 A1U2, the plane you're seeing on screen today. This saw the fitting of a Waffenbehälter Einsfunfeins or Weapon Container 151 into the plane's weapons bay, the weapons bay being the equivalent of the plane's bomb bay. This container was drum shaped and equipped with two 20mm MG151 cannon, 250 rounds per gun. This would supplement the existing forward firing nose armament of two 7.92mm MG17 machine guns, 1000 rounds per gun, and two 20mm MG151 cannon, 350 rounds per gun which was present on both the A1 and A2 subvariants of the ME410. Otherwise, the plane was the same as the standard A1, still featuring the two 13mm MG131 remote control defensive machine guns and powered by two Daimler-Benz DB603A inverted V liquid-cooled engines, each providing 1,750 horsepower. These initial two types of Umrus Belzetzer for the ME410 A1 were to start entering service as of May 1943 particularly with units operating on the North African front. They would be followed as of August 1943 with the anti-bomber U4 conversion set, this one seeing the ME410A1 being equipped with a single 50mm BK-5 cannon. An interesting side note, the ME410A1U2 effectively replaced the A2 as the Zestora. The reason for this was that it was intended for the A2 to mount a pair of 30mm MK-103 cannon in the weapons bay. However, the dual mount for the 30mm cannon was not available when the A2 went into production, hence why it shared the same standard armament as the A1 and was effectively replaced by the A1U2 when the Umrus Belzetzer conversion set became available. And with our historical overview concluded, let's just take a look at how the ME410 A1U2 handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the frontline map Gorge, for this will be using the following setup. Stealth belts for our offensive machine guns, the reasoning being in our experience the stealth belts are proven to be the most effective at dealing damage over time. But the main damage output of this aircraft is going to come from the offensive 20mm cannon, for which we are using the air target belts. This is due to their high proportion of high explosive incendiary mining shot shells which will rip apart any foe in the skies. Our defensive machine guns are equipped with the default belts as I personally feel the 50% concentration of armor piercing incendiary rounds within these belts outweighs in terms of damage output the 75% concentration of armor piercing tracer belts within the optional armored target belt. More on our usage of our turrets later on. Our gun convergence is set to 500 meters as all the armor to this plane is mounted down the center line and therefore not convergence reliant. And as for our fuel load, we're taking the minimum fuel load of 32 minutes to ensure we can make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis then by noting that in short distance climbs, the climb rate of the A1U2 is rather exceptional. Not to the point that it's going to be beating the best climbers at our battle rating, such as the A7M2 or the G55, but close enough to the likes of the good climbers such as the Spitfire F Mark IX. And combined with this, the attacker spawn that you get from the outset, and this means that you're able to swoop down on the weaker climbing opposition, such as the Yak-9T, and take them out of the game very quickly. And they won't even expect you. In return, we can use the great vertical energy retention of the A1U2 in order to swoop back up and regain all of the altitude we sacrificed in a gentle return climb, normally between 30 to 40 degrees. 
Even here we make a sweeping turn to go for the Wellington and we can see we've retained a good amount of our speed and we can still reconsolidate all of the altitude that we lost earlier on. Now at this point the comparison of our Skylar to the Wellington versus our friendly 109 presents a very nice fact about this aircraft. It's not as slow as one may think. Now the reason I'm saying this is because when you get to a battery rate in a 4.0, in the majority of cases I feel that heavy fighters start to drop off the map, other than the P-38 Lightning variants that are available in the American tech tree. This means that heavy fighters can have the net perception that they're going to be slow cumbersome aircraft, but what you're going to see over the course of this review is that the A1U2 does not live up to that expectation when played within its ideal trades, that being straight line interception and boom and zoom. We can appreciate the turn circle of this plane is extremely wide and therefore it's its weakness, it's not going to be a very good turn fighter, as we'll talk about controls later, things only get worse. But when you're in a straight line and making for linear tactics, you'll find that this plane is really going to take the opposition by surprise, so long as your teammates go for the opposition as much as you do. And what I mean by that is, in this game for example, we can see that both teams have gone for altitude and have tried to contest it. Now in those games where the enemy team pride themselves on altitude and your team forgets about it, you're going to have difficulty and those games will occur and you have to be much more subvertive in your tactics. But here with an open playing field we can start to use our interceptor role to great effect by going after the P-47 Thunderbolt who's trying to take on our Henschel 129 and we can cut them apart before they're able to carry on any more damage after knocking out our Henschel 129 sadly. But we carry our momentum through here towards the B-25 and whilst we do have a Firefly trying to chase us, we have the superior advantage in terms of top speed, whether it be in terms of our stack card or in the situation here, and it means we choose when to engage the Firefly, not the other way around. And in coming down the B-25J, we'll rip them apart very quickly, but we almost get ripped apart ourselves, because our pilot goes red. But we'll come around for the head-on with a Firefly before we talk about that durability concept. And here we're going to see the net advantage of having a nose mounted cannon in the fact that we have an effective range of 1.4 kilometers, whereas the wing mounted cannon on the Firefly will have a much more limited range, even if they've got their maximum convergence setting of 800 meters. Now that means that the head on concept can be rather strong in this plane. I go for head to heads on a regular basis, particularly when the enemy team seems to really dominate altitude and you're the last person left to contest them. But head ons also come with the downside. In fact, the durability of this plane is undermined by two key factors. Firstly, the exposed cockpit. Now this is contradictory, you'd think at first, because there's a significant amount of armor plating and armor glass around the cockpit, but look at how exposed the cockpit is, particularly to a head-on, alternatively, from attack from slightly above from the front. This means that your pilot can get quite easily knocked out along with the rear gunner in that scenario. The reverse of this is that when you are attacked from behind, the rear gunner being in their position far away from the barbette turrets, either remote control in the means, that your turrets are going to keep firing as long as you don't take hits towards the forward portion of the fuselage, mean that your turrets are going to be an annoyance until you pretty much die, by an annoyance for the enemy pilots chasing you. So it works on a plus and a negative side. But coming back to the undermining point, with the exposed, exposed cockpit I should say, being pilot sniped can be a regular feature until you really invest in your pilot and your gunner vitality. Add to this the durability of the airframe and being undermined by the number of fuel tanks in the extended wing. You have at least four from what I remember. And this means because they're all mounted side by side, when one of them is hit by an incendiary round and successfully ignited, and this seems to happen on quite a regular basis against American 50 cows for example, you'll find that that fuel tank goes up in flames and there's a very high chance of the fuel tank next to it going up in flames and this fire will spread all the way along the wing and in return you'll lose a good chunk of your aircraft's durability or indeed the entire airframe this will cause you to fall out of the sky or be in a position whereby as the fire goes out you'll have very little fuel left and you'll be in a very poor state and you'll not be combat effective you must go back and land otherwise you'll be knocking on death's door so these are some of the downsides to an otherwise very durable airframe and something that is a rather sturdy airplane in that it can take a good number of 20mm cannon shell hits before it falls out of the sky. Now as we pursue the enemy bomber here, the MB-162, that we, I, the team and myself have collectively enabled to get up to such a high altitude position, we should note that we are playing against the maximum altitude limit of this aircraft, which I've found to be in terms of controls, 5000 meters, above which the elevator becomes extremely heavy and you really need to play within your ideal speed range of 400 to 600 kilometers an hour to get it to work effectively, more on that ideal speed range later. And in terms of engine power, the Daimler Benz engines seem to lose a degree of their performance once you go above up 6,000 meters altitude, but it's a gradual drop off, and the drop off only becomes considerable once you hit 7,000 meters plus. 
In turn, with the twin engines of this aircraft, you're able to pursue bombers that go up to extreme altitude in a much more successful fashion, I feel, than the mono-engined fighters can, as you have a lot more engine power to be able to reconsolidate your position when you go into your stall. And keep in mind, at lower altitudes, your stall speed is 125 km an hour. Up at just over, uh, over 7,000 meters, I should say, your stall speed is heading more towards 175 km an hour. And the stall recovery goes up as a result. In your ideal altitude range of 3,000 to 5,000 meters, for example, your stall recovery requires you to get up to a speed of 275 km an hour before you gain control of all the control surfaces once more. As the 7,000 meters altitude, it goes up to 310 km an hour. But you can recover extremely fast because of the amount of engine power you have. And that means that MB-162 now has to use the rebound off the edge of the map in order to try and get away from us. And we will not be exploiting that, instead we are going to take a longer path and use our slow moving rudder to bring this plane around and build up speed and altitude. We'll explain as it happens. Now you can see the MB-162 is heading towards the map border and they're getting ready for the flip around. And we haven't actually expected this, I didn't realise it was going to happen, so I will get slightly frustrated as a pilot very shortly. But instead of getting frustrated visibly on screen, I'm going to use the weak rudder of this plane to swing it around, because the rudder of this aircraft is its weakest control surface by far. In that it's very slow and it doesn't bring the plane around very quickly, but you'd expect that for a plane of this size, you're going to have a poor flat rudder turning circle. And there we go, there's the rebound, and now we start to come around. Even when you implement your rudder to try and supplement your turn circle, you'll find it doesn't have too much of an impact. What we can see here is by doing this, whilst the MB-162 is gaining distance from us at the moment, because we haven't resorted to the rebound, it means that we're holding on to the altitude we have, and rather than having to pursue immediately with a climb, because we would have been rebounding at a lower altitude, we've maintained our altitude and we can now build up our speed in a straight line. And in return, the straight line acceleration of this plane is reasonable, even up at the most extreme altitudes, where you can go from your stall speed of 125 km an hour, typically, to 425 km an hour at a nice rate, and if you bring more emergency power into the mix, you'll be able to get up to 500 km an hour at a considerable rate, but to eat at lower altitude, not what you're seeing on screen right now. And that means you can start to bear down on foes at a rather aggressive rate, as the MB-162 is now experiencing that we're now really gaining on them, and we've taken away their altitude advantage. And for comparison, we do have a friendly Wyvern coming up, but you can see they're struggling to get up to this MB-162 as rapidly as we've been able to over the course of the match. Now maintaining and building up speed at this point, let's talk about the other control surfaces as standard. Your elevator, by contrast with your rudder, is your strongest control surface. In your ideal speed range of 400 to 600 km an hour, you can loop rather tightly and catch foes by surprise, and use aggressive loop in order to throw foes off your SIGs. Meanwhile, your roll rate is average at best, and it's not going to fall too far behind the likes of your mono-engined counterparts, but you do have to consider you do have a more exacerbated roll rate but you can change direction rather well, so long as you're not too close to terra firma, i.e. the ground. Now as we get closer to the MB-162 here, i.e. we're getting within our effective engagement range for our 20mm cannon, we can start to tear into their right hand wing. And we can start to compromise their performance as a result, meaning they're no longer able to get away from us, and instead have to resort to a dive. But the dive speed acceleration of the A1U2 is rather good, and it's above average, meaning that you're able to maintain your pursuit of bombers when they go into their extreme speed dives. And we can see here that MB-162 is now in a position whereby they've lost a considerable amount of control, including their entire control on the tail, I mean they're not going to be able to successfully or accurately bring the bomber around to hit our airfield anymore. And whilst you would expect by now we'd have to go for a reload, this goes to show you what happens when you have 1,200 cannon rounds available, as articulated our historical overview. We're now going for the reload so that way we can ensure we can deliver the coup de grace. But if we wanted to, we could have kept firing the other 230 so cannon rounds we had available before going for the reload. So reloads are going to come infrequently in this plane, even if you're not the most accurate player, due to the sheer amount of ammo you have. And the 2000 machine gun rounds also goes down well, as we now finish off the MB-162 for our ace in a day. Quite a long engagement, but we finally got them. But immediately, we now switch into a boom and zoom dive on an unsuspecting MS-406. It's probably not going to expect an A1U2 to come charging down on them in excess of 800 km an hour and just rip them apart like that. And that's the lovely thing about this plane, is in a boom and zoom dive, you're not compromised too heavily in terms of controllability, even at the most extreme speeds, as you head to your maximum dive speed of 892 km an hour. To put it in perspective, your elevator has no lockup, no matter what speed you're traveling at in terms of a high speed dive, meaning that you can use your elevator in the same performance rating as you would in your ideal speed range of 400 to 600 km an hour. 
Meanwhile, your roll rate is compromised by 25% when you go from 700 to 800 km an hour, but you can manage this quite easily to actually boom and zoom targets that may start to slightly notice your incoming and start to make evasive manoeuvres. The only downside in the boom and zoom is that you lose 50% of your rudder's controllability between 600 and 700 km an hour, meaning that you lose the ability to be as accurate in your boom and zoom passes and you have to anticipate your foe's movements early on in your dive in order to make sure you're accurate in the latter half. So that's the only downside for boom and zoom passes is that your rudder takes away some of your accuracy. But in turn we've been able to execute boom and zoom passes rather successfully so far and it's typically been because nobody's expected us to come down them like a ton of bricks. Now let's move on to this point about the ideal speed range. Why am I saying between 400 and 600 km an hour? Well there's a key weakness of low speed performance in this plane. That is below 300 km an hour the performance of this aircraft falls apart massively. Your climb rate, when you're climbing at say 15 degrees through to 25 degrees, which is my preferred climb angle, your climb rate drops off massively below 300 kilometers an hour, even at the lowest of altitude, meaning that you're going to be sacrificing one of the key assets you have in this plane, that being your short distance climb. And here we're not going to fall into that pitfall, climbing after the Wellington, who's also being engaged by our P-51 on the tail. On top of this, apart from your climb rate, what you'll find is your elevator becomes extremely heavy below 300 km an hour, and that means that loops in this plane or climbing spiral dogfights, i.e. when your foe tries to bait you into a turn fight against them, both you gain an altitude as you turn around one another, climbing spirals are going to be your detriment, and loops will be as well, as you become extremely slow to come around on your elevator control surface, which is why you need to keep above 300 km an hour at all cost. And to avoid losing all of that speed, particularly if you're in the horizontal, where your energy retention is not as good in the vertical, that's why I'm saying a starting ideal speed of 400 km an hour, going up to 600 km an hour, at which point you lose the ability to use your rudder as effectively. As we swoop down here on the Yak 9T and rip them apart for our, what is our eighth and final kill of this match. What about the defensive machine guns then? Because they've started opening fire on a LA-5F, who's not going to be able to catch up to us. The defensive machine guns of this plane I personally feel are not really worth worrying about. They're not going to do too much damage, I've yet to actually pick up an assist with them, let alone a kill, and I feel they're more of a warning device for you as the pilot to let you know somebody's coming onto your six. And what is nice about them is that they've got a phenomenal firing arc, although they're not going to be able to fire directly behind the plane, i.e. directly down the tail line, I meaning that is a blind spot for your defensive armament. But if you keep your speed up you should never find yourself in a situation where someone's directly on your tail in that blind spot. And with the barbettes being able to rotate even vertical, that means if someone's coming down on you and you're not looking up, you'll be warned on their oncoming presence just before it's too late, or at least hopefully. So that's where I'd use the turrets. They're not really going to be notching you up any kills. They're doing a phenomenal job. Now, is there anything else to note at this point? Well, you do have air brakes, which you can deploy at any time. We saw that in the historical section in the background. And you can use those air brakes to cut some of your speed and manage your boom and zoom dives when needs be. But if you're not too confident in handling this plane at extreme speeds, i.e. 800 km an hour plus. One thing to note about your dive speed acceleration, what we haven't articulated, is that when you go beyond 775 km an hour, your dive speed acceleration slopes off rather dramatically, meaning that getting to that maximum dive speed of 892 km an hour takes a considerable portion of time. But you can get there eventually. So normally you'll be maxing out roughly 850 km an hour in an extreme dive. And with the game coming to its end, it's time for us now to go take a look, as always, at the post-game stats. With our 8 kills, we're able to pick up 36,496 silver lines and 3,504 research points. To defeat the ME410A1U2 in a given matchup then, I can recommend one or two approaches. The first is to force it into a turn fight, and this will be the primary approach, and get its speed to drop below 300 km an hour, at which point the elevator of this plane is going to become extremely heavy for the pilot, and their climb rate performance is going to drop off to the point that a climbing spiral turn fight in particular will be to their detriment and in return you can quickly come around on their 6 and start to rip into the fuselage. Just keep in mind the defensive 13mm machine guns, which over time may do considerable damage to your aircraft, but not typically in a short burst. The alternative approach if you've got the superior climb rate over the long haul, in a plane such as the G55 or the A7M2, and even lower battle rate in planes such as the Messerschmitt 109F4, is to outclimb this plane over time and then attack it from above, when the pilot is going to be exposed and on top of that rear gunner as well. I mean, if you don't kill the pilot, you'll typically kill the rear gunner, and then you can swoop around on the 6 of this plane and just tear it to pieces for a clean cut kill. But by avoiding such circumstances in our own ME410A1U2 today, 
Hopefully we've demonstrated that this heavy fighter is extremely powerful when allowed to operate in the ideal altitude range of 3000 to 5000 meters, at which point the engines will be at their prime and you've got ample space in terms of altitude to dive away if the situation gets too hot, like the enemy team really starts to focus on you. And that means you can cause massive problems for the enemy team in terms of boom and zoom strikes and interception runs and be very difficult to keep pace with in the short distance. This means that the plane is effectively a clean conversion from the Messerschmitt 410A1 at the battery rate in a 3.3 to a battery rate in a 4.3 with the addition of two extra 20mm cannon. Otherwise there's no major difference, it's just that you're going up against tougher opposition, but fortunately for you, you've toughened up a little bit with additional firepower, I mean that as a last resort, if they want to go head to head, you can just tell them to bring it on. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, as always, take care, and good luck in the skies.